As a leader, there are many things to achieve, but only one reputation to have. And John Southers is a man who is a humble, who is humble as a leader, and a strong character as a person. So it's an honor to welcome to the stage this afternoon, Mayor John Southers. You know, the last time I spoke at the uh, Garden of the Gods Club was up in the main uh, dining room where you have the view of the mountains behind you. And I noticed that nobody looked at me the entire uh, <laughs> speech, so I'm hoping today to get a little bit more attention than I did the last time. Thanks so much for the uh, invitation to join you this afternoon and to address a very important uh, group of people. You know, present in this room today are people who have already achieved important positions in our community. Uh, others who will undoubtedly be an important part of the future leader, leadership of our community. Uh, the fact that many of you are in public, uh, public safety professionals indicates that your future leadership will significantly impact the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the High Street region. So given your important role in the community, I'm very honored uh, to be asked to talk to you about the subject of leadership. Uh, I want to ensure at the outset that you understand that I don't claim any particular expertise on the topic of leadership. I haven't written any books about it, I've written books about other things, but not about leadership. And I've never taught any seminars about it, but I have held a number of leadership positions. And over the years, uh, I've made a lot of observations about leadership. And many of these observations are certainly not unique. You've heard them before. But I think I'll share some other observations today that may give you a different slant on various aspects of leadership. My first observation has to do with how leaders are created. And I, I say with all sincerity, based on my experience, I'm convinced that leaders are made and not born. Now we've all heard the expression that so-and-so is a born leader. I think if you carefully analyze what they're saying, uh, they're saying that an individual has physical or personality characteristics that make it easier for them to be a leader. We all run across people that have those kinds of kind of charismatic personalities and uh, leadership uh, that helps uh, to be a leader. Uh, but the fact of the matter is those characteristics don't guarantee that an individual will be a good leader. Uh, some people are blessed with good looks or charismatic personalities that are conducive to leadership. Others of us are not, but that doesn't mean we can't become good leaders. Because ultimately, leadership requires hard work. If it doesn't require hard work, the leadership position doesn't count for much. If you're vested with leadership simply because of your name uh, or your station in life, you won't necessarily become a good leader. The world is full of talented failures and unfulfilled genius. Good leadership comes from effective performance over time. Effective leadership almost always involves a certain amount of dues pay. I always like to think back to my high school days. I contrast the person that got elected president of the freshman class, you know, based on like one meeting of the class, was clearly the you know most charismatic of the you know, the flaming personality in the group. Contrast that with the person who was elected the president of the senior class, the person that over four years had impressed their classmates and established credibility. There's a big difference. Um, it's my observation that good leaders are calculated risk takers uh, and they're competitors and understand there's much to be gained from the effort successful. Think about it, whether we're talking about uh, politics or organizational uh, leadership, you typically have to stick your neck out uh, if you're going to achieve a leadership uh, position. And um, that effort can be very beneficial to you even if you're unsuccessful. Because whether in electoral politics or corporate or organizational politics, taking on a leadership role often does involve taking a chance. As I say, sticking your neck out. And please keep in mind that when I talk today about political leadership, I'm using the term political in its broadest context. Because politics is ultimately about how people collectively achieve their objectives. Ultimately, all organizational leadership is political leadership. 
One of my favorite quotes is from Teddy Roosevelt, who said, far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, though your efforts be checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much, because they linger in the gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. What's required, folks, is that you handle yourself in competition for leadership positions in a way that impresses people and furthers your credibility, and not in a way that will serve to disqualify you, qualify you from future opportunities. I'm constantly um, observing people, particularly in politics, that run a campaign that the darn well better win because if they don't, they'll, they can't get a job as a dog catcher the way they uh, behave. Uh, and that's not the way uh, you handle uh, competition for leadership uh, positions. Uh, I've run for public office six times. My wife is, knows that on the top of her head. Uh, and I've only lost one of those uh, six elections for when I ran for Attorney General in 1998 and lost by a very narrow margin. But I can absolutely assure you I learned more from that experience than all the elections I've won. Um, and thankfully, I handled myself in a way that I remained a viable candidate for a variety of leadership positions in the future, including uh, Colorado Attorney General. I told you that uh, good leaders are calculated risk takers um, and engage in realistic goal setting. They understand that setting and achieving short-term goals sets you up for the achievement of long-term goals. I think realistic goal setting is very important in the development of leaders, and I include career goal setting in that. Um, you know, Bill Clinton may have decided in eighth grade he wanted to be president of the United States for most of it, most of us, certainly, it just doesn't work that way. Um, I think my life uh, is a pretty good example of how it typically works. When I was a young person, honestly, I remember my dad asking me when I was about 10 or 11 what I wanted to be. And I told him I thought jumping on and off a garbage truck looked like a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'll never, by the way, I'll never forget what he said. My father died when I was 15, and my mom died a few years later. But I'll never forget what my father said to me. It's lived with me to this day. He said, you know, John, uh, just remember that if you do become a garbage man, you want to be the best garbage man there ever was. And a lot of parents say that. But he then went on to say something that has always stuck with me. He said, and just remember that in the day that the guy picks up your garbage, they're more important your quality of life than the President of the United States. And I think about that a lot. Matter of fact, I was taking the garbage out yesterday, and I thought, you know, if that guy didn't come around and pick up your garbage and your garage smelled like hell, that is a lot more of a deleterious effect on, on your life than what goes on in Washington. Uh, uh, every day, and it, 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 it implanted in me early on this notion that everybody plays a role and everybody plays a very important role, and you as a leader have to uh, remember that and show affirmation to everybody in your organization that's playing those roles that make that organization uh, work. But in terms of this career goal setting, I do think my life is pretty, a pretty good example of how it typically works. Um, I didn't grow up saying, oh, I want to be mayor of Colorado Springs, or I want to be attorney general of Colorado. It was much, you know, I, um, I did well in school, I had the opportunity to get a college scholarship, uh, I did well in college, uh, I figured that uh, my skill set seemed to be about, uh, you know, oratory and uh, uh, writing, and she gave me how to be a lawyer. Uh, I went to uh, law school. Uh, in law school, I had an internship with the DA's office, and I just fell in love with the work that prosecutors do. And so I said, I'm going to start out my career as a prosecutor. Uh, you know, my goal, my parents were dead at that time, and I was very focused on, I just want to lead uh, a meaningful life. I want to do something meaningful. And um, uh, I enjoyed uh, my work as a prosecutor. I was pretty good at it. And after four years when I left, I thought, you know, if I ever get the chance to run for district attorney, that'd be a, a great job. And I went into private practice. Uh, the, uh, my wife refers to it as the golden age of my career when I actually made money. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, after 10 years in private practice, I had the opportunity to run for 
uh, district attorney, and I did, and as a result of having uh, done well in the office before, doing well in private practice, have a broad range of support in the community, uh, got elected. Uh, did a pretty good job as uh, uh, Attorney General over eight years, uh, uh, and here's a, here's a good lesson about relationships, by the way. Uh, one of the guys, I was the chairman of the DA's legislative committee for four years, one of the guys I dealt with the most was a, a senator from Aurora called Bill Owens at the, the legislature. Uh, next thing I know, uh, uh, Bill Owens is calling me after uh, I'm leaving the, uh, leaving the uh, DA's office and said, uh, hey, how'd you like to, he just got elected uh, 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 governor of Colorado, how'd you like to run the Department of Corrections? And uh, thought, the great thing about that, by the way, it's the only Department of State Government that's based out outside of Denver, it's based in Colorado Springs, so I could sleep in my own bed and watch my kids' baseball games and stuff like that. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, that, that job has eaten up a lot of people and been spit out by the legislature. I'm here to tell you today that my three years uh, running the Colorado Department of Corrections with uh, 6,000 employees, 20,000 inmates, and all those facilities, if, if, I, if somebody says, what's the best uh, experience you had for uh, being mayor of, of a big city, it was running the Colorado Department of Correction. <laughs> now, I'm not comparing all my uh, my citizens to inmates by any stretch of imagination, but there are an awful lot of analogies. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, I, I impressed Governor Owens, so that same guy all of a sudden calls me up and says, hey, my good buddy George W. Bush just got elected President of the United States. Uh, can I put in your name for the United States Attorney? And oh, okay. And the next thing I know, I'm the United States Attorney. I have the ability to, you know, I, I became the United States Attorney a couple of days before 9 11 and had the ability to deal with that through that very important uh, um, chapter in our nation's uh, history. Guess what? Next thing I know, Bill Owens is calling me and saying, uh, get the relationship thing I'm talking about here. Uh, so be, be careful about who you tick off with my bottom line here. You never know. Uh, you know, in that, in that, uh, in your police recruit class or your fire department recruit class, the guy that you think's an asshole may be the chief of the uh, I mean, it happened in the case of Perry and uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, be don't burn any bridges, is what I'm saying. Okay? Don't burn any bridges. And so the next, uh, so the next thing you know, I'm, uh, Owen says, hey, uh, Ken Salazar just got elected to the United States Senate. I need to appoint uh, someone to fill out the next uh, two years of the Attorney General's office. Uh, would you do it? And my wife, having become very used to decreases in pay by this time, but whatever. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, and I wound up uh, doing that for, uh, for 10 years. My point is, at no point in time, uh, you know, did I have this grand vision of, you know, this is my career track or anything like that. It was a matter of uh, taking a job that intrigued you at the time and you felt was challenging, doing well at it, and that produced other opportunities. That's how most people uh, wind up, uh, you know, in the upper echelons of the police department or the fire department or uh, government or the military or whatever. You know, they do well at each stage of the game, and that contributes to, and, and it's a result of that success. It's not because they walked into uh, work the first day and said, I want to be a four-star general. Now, maybe they did, but they at least worked hard enough at every stage of the game to make sure uh, that that worked out. I also believe sustained effective leadership requires personal balance and emotional support. I feel pretty strongly about this. Uh, that's why leaders should never lose sight of life's priorities. And that often means relationships. You should always seek positions of responsibility that are consistent with your personal, family, and financial obligations in mind. I've watched many people, particularly in politics, destroy relationships because they sought positions that undermine the financial or emotional security of those relationships. That's why it's uh, important for people in leadership positions to have well-ordered personal lives and have access to emotional support from friends and families as they face the significant challenges leadership can bring. And I've done a lot of teaching. I've taught at UCCS and I've 
uh, taught law school at the University of Denver, and the last day of class, I always say, okay, if you, here's what you paid for. Uh, well, we, I'm through talking law, I'm gonna give you uh, the three most important things in life, the key to a happy life, and they'll get their pen out and all that kind of stuff. And here's what I tell you. Someone to love, it can be your dog, uh, but you gotta have somebody to love. Uh, um, uh, something meaningful to do, that's what, that's what gives you meaning in life. You have to have something meaningful to do and something to hope for. Always, regardless of where you are in life, you know, what's a guy at my age hope for? Uh, I had uh, a 37-year-old daughter and a 33-year-old daughter and no grandkids. Well, guess what? The last eight months, I acquired two grandkids. So that's good. <laughs> and they finally got around to it. You, know? uh, you always have to have, uh, so I repeat that. Someone to love, something meaningful to do, um, uh, something to hope for. Uh, a well-ordered personal life, I have found, uh, is pretty essential uh, to effective leadership. Now, folks, I've also found significant confusion about a very fundamental issue, what true leadership entails. I encounter a lot of people to this day, uh, particularly in politics, that think leadership is simply figuring out what your constituents want or members of your organization want and trying to achieve it. In other words, you know, you just say, okay, what do we want to do? Uh, voters, what do you want? And then your goal becomes, and, and there's a certain attraction to that. You're a representative of the people. You're a representative of your organization. Uh, so it's easy to say, okay, what do you guys want? But true leadership, those folks, by the way, always have their finger in the wind and prepared to advocate for whatever the majority seems to want. But based on my experience, that's not what good leaders do. Leaders are not mere poll takers. Real leadership involves, in many instances, convincing your constituents or the members of your organization what they ought to want. That's where leadership comes in. Let me repeat that. Uh, it's your job as a leader. One of the reasons you're a leader is you have a base of knowledge about your organization. You've got a base of knowledge about your community. Uh, you need to ascertain what needs to be done, and that may entail convincing your constituents, the members of your organization, what they ought to want. Um, I, I hope that those of you that are in uh, higher positions in the police department, fire department, uh, understand what I'm talking about here. Let me give you some examples. Trust me, if I did a poll today and uh, had everybody in Tower Springs list what they want from government, stormwater would not be in the top two. <laughs> okay, that's just a reality. But guess what? I got the feds breathing down my throat. I've got Pueblo trying to block the uh, southern delivery system and things like that. We've been kicking this stormwater thing down the road for years and years and years. We can't do it anymore. It's my job as a leader to go out there and convince the public that this is something they ought to want to fix. Um, you know, if you just do a poll in the sheriff's department or the police department, what do you want? I guarantee you what the answer is, you want more pay. And when you want to deliver that, you also have obligations uh, in terms of delivering public safety. And that may involve some other things that should be done. Is that what you mean? Just cut out. contradictory things at the same time. And the classic example of that is folks who want more government services and lower taxes. And that's every, that person you ever have, right? That's my city. Um, and you've got to deal with that in your organizations too. Folks want contradictory things. You cannot deliver both. Um, and it's your job as an effective leader to shepherd them through a realistic prioritization process. You know, in perhaps the greatest single essay on American politics, Federalist Paper Number 10, uh, James Madison said this, and this is what political leadership is all about. 
The purpose of delegating decision making to a small number of citizens chosen by the rest is to allow them to refine and enlarge the public view and add deliberation and reason to that view. What is essential is leaders sustained by the people's support but insulated from their merely momentary inclinations. Leaders who have the opportunity <laughs> <laughs> uh, leaders who have the opportunity to transcend the maelstrom of various private interests and engage in the deliberation and judgment necessary to achieve the public good. It's not just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, why would we have any kind of representative government if their job is just to find out what they're thinking at that particular point in time and, uh, and, and uh, pull a lever. A leader's job is to delve into the issues in a way that their constituents, members of their organization, uh, their, their community constituents, can't possibly delve into in that depth uh, and uh, show them the way. Here's what we ought to be doing and here's how we can get there. Uh, and that's, as I say, what I think true leadership is all, is all about. Now, I've mentioned the word credibility several times already, and effective leadership requires credibility. The people you lead must trust you to act in the best interest of those you lead. And herein lies a stark reality that limits the number of people uh, who can ultimately become effective leaders. Because you see, credibility does not flow automatically from hard work and preparation. Credibility does not always emerge from calculation or uh, strategic sessions. Where does credibility emerge from? It emerges from character. It's expressed in qualities of an individual, not in the mere quantity of their time and effort. Character and credibility are essential to effective leadership. As character and resulting credibility, in my opinion, fades somewhat from the discourse of American leaders, there's a sinister plague of hyperbole and untruth that threatens our country's health and well-being. I hope that all of you have also come to the conclusion that character and effective leadership are inseparable. I guess that I could hypothesize a scenario where a person of poor character could, on the basis of his own self-interest, assume a leadership role on a short-term basis. I suspect Hitler would be a prime example. You might even get elected president of the United States without getting high marks for character. And I don't mean that to be a political commentary. But getting elected and leading are different tasks. Becoming a leader and leading are different tasks. And it's apparent to me that sustained and truly effective leadership in a position of high responsibility is typically the province of people of good character. In exploring the topic of, uh, of the role of character in good leadership, I'd like to share with you two closely related concepts, neither of which are new and neither of which originate with me, but two concepts that have been very important to me in my life that I think about a lot. The first is that of the virtuous citizen, first discussed by Greek philosophers. And the second is the concept of obedience to the unenforceable a phrase first coined by an English judge named John Fletcher Moulton about a century ago. I believe that these concepts are extremely pertinent to the discussion of character and leadership in the 21st century. And in fact, I do not believe that an American, blessed to live in a nation which affords tremendous personal freedom, can be a person of good character without being a virtuous citizen who is obedient to the unenforceable. Let me explain. Since the days of Plato and Aristotle, our greatest thinkers understood that effective self-governance is wholly dependent upon a law-abiding citizenry, what these political theorists call a virtuous citizenry. Now the word virtue is a word that may make some of you nervous. We should clarify its meaning as a political term, and the Greeks used it as a political term. Virtuous citizenry does not require the sanctity of Mother Teresa of Calcutta or St. Francis of Assisi. Very few of us can achieve that. Rather, it simply requires a recognition of the importance of acting responsibility, responsibly in your own interests, in the interests of your family, and in the interests of the community as a whole. 
The virtuous citizen exercises both civic and personal responsibility. And as I indicated, America's form of government, to be effective, requires the vast majority of its citizens to be virtuous in that context. And reflect for a moment, that's not necessarily the case with other forms of government. The continued existence of a dictatorship may depend upon the virtue of the dictator, but not on that of the citizenry. So too a successful monarchy depends upon the virtue of the monarch. But in a free society such as ours, virtuous citizens in the legislature, the executive branch, the judiciary, law enforcement, the ballot box, the classroom, the corporate suite, the job site, and the church pulpit are absolutely essential. And to the extent that our American society today is not virtuous enough, the political framework of our society is threatened. The institutional structure of the United States of America as engineered by our founders is wholly dependent upon civic virtue on the part of its lawmakers and its law enforcers. And it will degenerate beyond recognition if civic virtue is not continually nurtured and celebrated. Plato said that, quote, the community suffers little if its cobblers have become degenerate pretentious, but if the guardians of the law and of the state will alone have the opportunity to bring good government and prosperity become a mere sham, then the community is ruined, unquote. And Aristotle pointed out that the key to producing virtuous citizens is to teach our children habits of the heart. And that's the terminology they used. Virtuous citizenry learned early in the life becomes a matter of habitual reflex rather than premeditated action. Virtuous people, as soon as the problem is presented, uh, uh, as a matter of reflex, are able to, to evaluate right and wrong, as opposed to sitting down and, and deliberating. Uh, now, sometimes it, it is a quote, quote question. I won't, I won't say that there is no deliberation. Uh, but uh, being taught habits of the heart from your childhood uh, teaches you uh, how to deal with moral dilemmas as you face them throughout your life. Virtuous citizens do the right thing because it's the right thing, regardless of whether anybody notices. And therein lies an excellent segue into this closely related notion that I mentioned of obedience to the unenforceable. In his writings, John Fletcher Moult divided human actions into three domains that everything you do every day, you can divide into three domains. The first is the domain of the law, where he said our actions are prescribed by laws binding upon us, which must be obeyed. If we do not, the government will impose whatever consequences are necessary to coerce obedience. If you commit murder, you go to jail. If you don't pay your taxes, you suffer the consequence. But folks, simply obeying the law <coughs> to avoid the consequences of violating it is not an act of good character, but rather of self-preservation. The other extreme is the, the domain of free choice, which he said includes all those actions as to which we claim and enjoy complete freedom. And we make hundreds of these sorts of decisions every day. No one suffers much by the choices we make. No one cares if I wear a red tie instead of a blue one. No one cares if you choose Colgate rather than press to brush your teeth. Certainly, good character is not essential in this domain. But in between the domain of the law and the domain of free choice, Judge Moulton identified a, a domain in which our actions are not determined by the law, not by the coercion of the law, but in which we should also not be free to behave in any way we choose because of the consequences of our actions to ourselves and to those around us. In this domain, we act with greater or lesser freedom from constraint on a continuum which extends at one extreme from consciousness of duty, which is nearly as strong as the written law, to the other extreme, which is viewed simply as good form appropriate in, good, in a given situation. In other words, we are not compelled uh, to engage in the uh, obedience to the unenforceable but we do it because it's the right thing to do. Examples of actions on this continuum would include such infractions as adultery, no longer an act of criminal offense, but an act which has significant personal and societal ramifications. 
or lying about your age to get into a movie for a cheaper price or to secure a cheaper ski lift ticket. Think about it, folks. And some of you may have seen this. I've, I've, I've absolutely observed this. You know, you're in line for something, and let's say you're going to a movie. There's a guy there with his kid, and the sign says 12 and under have a reduced rate. And father turns to his 13-year-old and says, today you're 12. <laughs> Nobody's going to arrest him. No sanction is going to take place. But what that says to that young person is incredibly impactful. When that father says it's OK to lie or cheat, that's where this domain of the unenforceable uh, is found. Um, the, these some are sometimes not matters of much consequence, but ones that are the root of good character. Matters that can pro profoundly influence the character development of your children, that witness them. Lord Bolton considered this act, area of action line between the law and pure personal preference to be what he called the domain of obedience to the unenforceable. The obedience in this domain is the obedience imposed by man upon himself and not by any external authority. It is your performance in the domain of obedience to the unenforceable that determines your character. Obeying the law to avoid the consequences of disobedience does not make you a person of good character, but doing the right thing because it's the right thing, regardless of whether anyone notices, that's the essence of good character. Milton observed that the more civilized and enlightened a community of people are, the greater their dependence on the voluntary respect and support of people for law and civil order. Ultimately, the rule of law depends upon the morality of people. Obedience to the unenforceable is required to give the rule of law the power of enforcement, which is essential, uh, uh, which is its essential character. Police can't be everywhere. Um, a, a lot of uh, the observance of the law that's actually imposed every day uh, is to a large extent obedience to the enforcement. Now, John Sil Silver, S-I-L-V-E-R, the, pre the former president of Boston University, in a famous commencement address at Harvard, suggested that there is a serious decline in obedience to the unenforceable in today's America. He believes that television, in combination with family dysfunction, is the societal force most responsible for such decline. He suggested that television has become the most important educational institution in America and believes that the mores portrayed on prime time television have reinforced the notion that because no significant consequences attach to various sexual and antisocial behaviors, the formative potential of the church, family, and school to develop virtuous citizens has been seriously eroded. And of course, poorly parented children are especially vulnerable to this moral corruption. Silver is convinced, and I suggest we all should be, that the future of our country, our future happiness, and that of our children depends decisively on whether we as individuals and collectively as a people have the fortitude to resist unhealthy cultural trends and to nurture civic virtue and practice obedience to the unenforceable. Sadly enough, demonstrating the type of character necessary for good leadership today often requires you to be somewhat countercultural. That's a sad reality today. Uh, the culture, uh, in many respects, uh, is uh, the exact opposite of obedience to the unenforceable. And if you're going to be a moral person of good character, you have to be somewhat countercultural. That's a sad reality. Our society today values celebrity over genuine achievement. And as we know, celebrity often stems from questionable character. They're celebrities because <coughs> they're of questionable character. I believe the great challenge of America's third century is to reestablish through our families, our churches, and our schools an understanding on the part of each of us the extent to which the survival of our great nation depends on the virtue of its citizenry. We cannot allow ourselves to become too pessimistic. Americans have traditionally shown a great capacity for self-removal. And folks, the fact is this nation is full of good people and good families. And while the social problems we face may seem immense and overwhelming, I assure you that each one of us can be a part of the solution. In fact, we must be part of the solution. Uh, 
for we know that evil will flourish if good men and women do nothing. Edmund Burke told us that. A community is, a vir is virtuous when the individuals who comprise it are virtuous. A well-ordered personal life promotes a well-ordered family life, and a well-ordered family life promotes a well-ordered state. The solution begins with each and every one of us doing everything we can in our own world, in our own jobs, in our own churches, in our own schools, and most importantly, in our own families, to promote civic virtue and obedience to and enforcement. That's what people of good character do, and that's what good leaders do. I was asked to say a word about crisis leadership, and I'll uh, do it very briefly. Quite simply, exercising leadership based on good character will help prepare you for crisis leadership. Crisis leadership involves acquiring adequate knowledge to act in a crisis, engaging in adequate preparation, and understanding your proper role in the event of a crisis. The effective leader in crisis will calmly and deliberately play the assigned role as well as possible. Uh, he or she will not seek the limelight, but at the same time will not shrink from the responsibility that comes with your leadership position. And all of us have been at the scene and watched good leaders handle themselves. Uh, it's a crisis, uh, big and small, uh, that so often exposes a leader uh, as good or bad. And you simply can't be a good leader in important areas of endeavor, including law enforcement and public safety, unless you can effectively lead in the crisis. So thank all of you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to join you this afternoon and share some of my observations about leadership. As I said at the outset, I'm certain in this room today are leaders that will play a major role in the future of our great city. And I hope I've given you some things to think about in regard uh, to the role of character and leadership. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Do you have some questions for the mayor? We got some time here. Uh, every time I get the chance, 
I'm, uh, I'm walking. I'm walking and thinking. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I notice through the years, I read a lot of, uh, I'm a big history buff, and I'm always reading uh, biographies, autobiographies, and things like that. And I've noticed uh, uh, how often uh, people like Thomas Jefferson talked about the importance of walking and thinking. Uh, notice they didn't jog with him. They walked. <laughs> And uh, uh, it also preserves your knees for a longer period of time. Uh, and I try to do that. Um, I do. I, I spend uh, an hour or two um, hiking around and thinking about uh, what the issues coming up are and things like that. And then um, getting together with uh, uh, good friends. My wife is uh, so good about separating, even when I was in, in uh, partisan politics, making sure that we had a, a set of friends that were just totally, completely removed uh, from the torment of politics. And uh, that's, that helps a lot. That really helps a lot. Um, so you, you do the, the best you can. You do need uh, some exercise. I do, if, um, if I don't have a speech in the morning, I do try and get in uh, the gym about 5.30 that's the best I can I can do. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. General. Greg. 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 Oh, that's right. He's a civilian now. Uh, General Greg. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that question. I think a couple things did. Um, I had a couple of ex experiences that the way things, the kind of the sequence of things, made a huge impact on me. I told you my father died when I was 15. Uh, that was the most, by far and away, the most traumatic event of my life. Um, lost my mother uh, into my college. Nothing impresses you about the brevity of life. Uh, quicker than that. And so I think I started thinking a lot earlier in life than a lot of people do about, hey, what are you going to do with you know, 60, 70, 80 years? And um, I just I started focusing on wanting to make sure I did something uh, meaningful. Shortly after I uh, uh, lost my father, um, I had a Latin teacher in St. Mary's by the name of Sister Georgetta. Sister Georgetta was 80 years old when I had her. Uh, you know how uh, now you think back and you think, well, your teacher was old, and then you think about it, they were really 35. You know? <laughs> now, Sister Georgetta was old. And she was like four foot ten, and she was a Latin scholar. She used to spend her summers uh, translating documents for the Vatican. And she was also a Roman history scholar. And my father died over the, the summer. And I, I went back and, and early, uh, she, she's talking about, um, uh, talking from Roman history, uh, and this is all true by the fact, uh, by the way, I've, I've seen it confirmed in many other uh, places. Uh, the Romans had, when the, the Roman conquerors came back from uh, a foreign conquest, they had something called the triumph. And they would come down the Appian Way, and all the Romans would come out and you know, throw uh, arrows and all this kind of thing. And the heroes of the particular campaign would each be assigned a uh, chariot that they were uh, individually in. But behind each of them would be a, a slave whose job it was, only job it was, to whisper in the ear of the conquering hero, seek transit glory and women which means quickly uh, passes the glory of the world. Uh, in that context, to remind them that the interests of Rome were paramount, uh, you know, fame is fleeting. In today's context, it's kind of like today's headlines are tomorrow's fish wrapping, uh, stuff like that. So don't get too hung up in 
uh, what they're saying about you uh, in the newspapers and stuff like that. Uh, character is uh, really all that endures. That made such an impression on me. Um, I, I just started, you know, and by the way, she went on to elaborate about how important it is to make sure you choose to do something meaningful in life. And here I am, you know, 15 years old, and I'm starting to think about this. So I think that had a, a lot of uh, uh, influence. But I think the other critical decision point for me, I went into private practice, and I was doing very, very well. In 1986, I was uh, 30, 34, 35 years old in Colorado Springs and made like $150,000. That was a lot of money in 1986. And uh, I'm thinking about whether I should run for district attorney in a couple years that paid, uh, it's, it wasn't good money like in a million minutes. It was $60,000. So I was gonna take you know, a two and a half times pay cut. And right then, and I, if, if you folks have not seen this, you need to watch it, Ken Burns Civil War series. It is absolutely the best thing that was ever on television. And I'm watching this on television. And I'm watching all these young people making a decision, you know, whether, whether you're, right, you're fighting for the South or fighting for the North, uh, uh, you know, they were, they were all motivated by their belief in something, whether it be states' rights or whether it be, uh, you know, the preservation of the Union, anti-slavery, or whatever. And they're out there dying by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and uh, if, if, when you read this, there's a letter that a very intelligent guy, who's a lawyer from uh, uh, Rhode Island by the name of Sullivan Blue, because, uh, he's uh, preparing for the first battle of uh, Bull Run, and he knows he's <laughs> leading the charge of the infantry, and the chances of him surviving aren't very good. And he writes this letter to his wife. It's the most amazing thing he's ever read. He talks about, I'm probably going to die, but it's worth it. Um, the, you know, my, well, my forefathers uh, gave their blood for the re revolution to make this country what it is, and I'm willing to die to keep it together. And so I'm watching this and thinking, you know, here I'm debating whether or not I'm going to make 150 grand or not, or whether I ought to be uh, doing something more that would be more meaningful in terms of, uh, and that, believe it or not, why, that had a huge impact on me. And I remember shortly thereafter, I said, I'm going to run for uh, district attorney, and uh, my wife's life hasn't been the same since. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay, Mayor. thank you all. Appreciate Mayor. it. Oh. Oh. Yes, Steve. In the corner, sir. So put your futurist hat on for us. Uh, what do you see as the Colorado Springs region, Pikes Peak region? The next three to five years are uh, challenges and then our opportunities as a city. Um, challenges and opportunities as a, as a city. Um, I, I can't tell you how pleased I am with the progress that Colorado Springs has made in the uh, last 20 months. A lot of it's luck, um, but uh, you know, when I became mayor, I said, um, I identified three things that needed to happen. Colorado Springs get moving again. And that's, that was the whole thing in the TV ad. Number one, we had, had to create a better political climate. We had to have less dysfunction between the mayor and the council, the mayor and other governmental bodies in uh, the Pikes Peak region, uh, a much more collaborative uh, relationship because, and boy, has this been confirmed for me since, uh, people pay attention to that. Uh, I now know that the search firms Companies that are looking to relocate, they hire a company to identify places for them. You know, they give them the criteria, we want cost of living, it's important those utilities costs and everything. And then the company puts all this in a computer and starts looking at communities. And one of the things they do, I mean, I, I've seen this, uh, they spit out a, a political environment thing that has all the articles about everything going on in the community. And we used to have, you know, uh, mayor calls councilman Bergman. Uh, the councilman calls Mayor Birdbrain today. 
the mayor, the council calls the, the mayor for a friend, but the, the mayor doesn't send an email back. <laughs> and so there, therefore, it doesn't get in the Gazette. He laughs, but that's true. Um, and it's, it makes for a whole different thing. So we, we made some improvements there, and I think that's helped. The other thing is we had to deal with some long neglected infrastructure problems. One of, them, one of them's easy to deal with because it's sexy. People knew they had to fix the roads. The stormwater thing has just been deteriorating on us for years, and all of a sudden we have two huge legal problems we had to address. We've addressed one of them, uh, still got the other one. We've got to resolve uh, that, uh, that problem. It's an essential government service. Uh, there's no substitute for it. We've, we've got to do it. The other, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about challenges in the future. Uh, the other thing that we needed to do, you know, we went for 15 years from 20 to 2015, and a lot of this had something to do with the national economy, but it was exacerbated here. Uh, we had virtually flat job growth. Um, we lost jobs, some, some high paying, high tech jobs in the 90s. Uh, we were able to fill the number of jobs, but largely with lower paying jobs. And we had virtually no wage growth for 15 years. Uh, just to give you an example, from 20 to 2015, we averaged uh, 3,000 new jobs a year in the, in the, in the city. We went kind of up and down like that, but we averaged 3,000. And a city this size, we need to average about 5,000 just to break even. So we had a 10% unemployment rate in what, 2012, something like that. Um, to, to show you how things have turned around, in the last 20 months, we've created 16,000 jobs. And uh, they're good jobs. Um, uh, for example, we have 10,400 job openings right now. Uh, average wage is $65,000. The top 15 uh, uh, are largely uh, uh, like RN and some cybersecurity jobs and things like that, uh, the top 1,500 are average $95,000. So our economy has really uh, turned around. In terms of the challenges facing the city, one of them is very pertinent to, to public safety. Um, because we had, uh, the voters did away with, you know, what, what got us in, in deep legal trouble, uh, is the fact that we, like every major city, had a dedicated funding source for stormwater. We had a stormwater fee that was uh, begun in 2005, raised $16 million a year to deal with stormwater infrastructure and programming. Uh, Doug Bruce led a campaign in uh, 2009 against it, calling it a rain tax, stop the rain tax. And the city did a very poor job. Of course, it had to be the elected officials, the only one that could speak out about it of educating the public about it. And the voters did away with it in 2009. And after that, we've, we've been spending $16 million a year. Next thing you know, we're averaging $3 million a year in stormwater from that point forward. Well, the problem is the year before, in 2008, we promised Pueblo as a condition of getting permission to build the uh, southern delivery system, this massive water delivery system that's going to take care of us for the next 15 years. It hasn't. $825 million investment by the rate payers, uh, they're saying, uh, when you gave, we gave you permission to build that, gave you what's called a 1041 permit, you promised to maintain a viable stormwater system, and you're not doing it. We're going to sue you to block the southern delivery system from going online. And then the feds, uh, who have jurisdiction because uh, uh, the, the, the water that we put in the, in the, in the system, our stormwater, Obviously, goes into the interstate river system, and they issue what's called an MS4 permit uh, to us to ensure that we do what we can to clean up the water before we dump it into uh, Fountain Creek, which goes into the Arkansas, which goes into Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. So they come and do a um, audit in 2013. It's horrible, and they come back in 2015. We haven't done anything about it, and so they sue us. And I've got no funding source to deal with it. Uh, so we settled uh, with Pueblo, basically what they were demanding, which seemed reasonable to me, you spend the same amount that you would have over the next 20 years that you would have spent if you had a the stormwater enterprise in place, uh, which for the first five years would be about 17 million a year, and uh, 18 for the next five, and things like that. And we agreed to do that. But as of now, it's coming out of general fund, and unless and until we get the voters to buy off on a dedicated funding stream. Well, taking that out of general fund puts a lot of pressure on other uh, general fund priorities, and what's the biggest general 
National Fund Priority Group. Police and fire are 55% of the budget. So the goal has got to be, I can't do it today because I don't know what the federal situation is. We're trying to settle within the confines of the intergovernmental agreement. But until that federal thing is resolved, I know exactly how much money we need. Only then can I look the voters in the eye and say, if you do this, this truly does put the issue to rest uh, for 20 years, 40 years, whatever. And so uh, until we do that, we're putting uh, uh, pressure on the general fund, which gives me, and thank you, Steve, for this, an opportunity to pitch issue two uh, on the April uh, 4th ballot, which is the city asking the voters to allow us to keep $6 million in, uh, in revenue that we've taken in over the Tabor limit and apply it to stormwater needs so that we can spend more than $17 million in the first couple of years. And then even if we have a downturn, we'll average that $17 million. And more importantly, for a police and fire in this room, <coughs> we'll probably free up about $3 million a year in the general fund. So we won't have to take out a general fund. Now, you say, well, we might even have to ask the voters. Well, here's how it works. Under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, believe it or not, under the local government growth formula, the city of Tower Springs could, could only grow in revenue in uh, 2016, the year just over with, by 2.4%. That's inflation, this is 1.2%, plus something, it's the weirdest formula we've ever seen. Uh, you know, on the state level, it's inflation plus population growth. For the cities, it's inflation plus uh, construction minus destruction. I can't pretend to explain it to you other than it's a number that the assessor sends us at the end of the year, and this year is 1.2%. So we could only grow by 2.4%, even though the sales tax revenues grew by 9%. And that's ultimately, in my opinion, the biggest problem with Tabor. I don't mind voters, you know, uh, having to approve tax increases. I don't mind having some kind of a formula cap. I, would, I, I think it ought to be more related to what cities spend money on, um, asphalt, concrete, and stuff like that. But the problem is, you know, we had a big downturn. Uh, city revenues were down 16% uh, in, the, in the recession. And you can only grow from that at these increments that Tabor allows you to, even though the economy's growing much faster. So uh, we have a $10 million surplus over that 2.4 revenue cap, and you have to ask the voters to keep any of it. Uh, I did some polling. Um, I don't, I, you know, I told you leadership isn't just polling, but let me tell you where polling comes in. Because once you decide, uh, you know, what, what, what you want, what the constituents ought to want, then you gotta figure out how to get them from what they ought to want to get them over there. And that's where polling comes in, uh, kind of interesting, because you ask them, well, does this make a difference to you? Does this make a difference to you? Does it make a difference to you that we're getting sued about this? And, and what we found is, if it's 30 bucks out of the pocketbook, they'll probably let us keep it. If we get up over 50, then they get real tempted. That's why we're, uh, we're asking to keep 10, uh, or uh, 6 million of the 10 million ac ac excess minimum refund uh, the others, um, because uh, six is better than none. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the bottom line is, um, I, I think the issue uh, of the next several years is to make sure our public safety professionals are adequately uh, staffed. Um, uh, I, I don't want to offend either uh, fire or police here, I will tell you, uh, that I do believe our staffing issues are more serious uh, in the police department in terms of the, the, the averages on the streets and things like that. And those are big ticket items. And folks, you cannot pay for this out of one time dollars. That's not what you pay for with a, a, a refund or anything like that. It's actually more serious. That has, those are permanent dollars. And if you put 100 cops on the street, that's $10 million <coughs> each and every year thereafter. And, uh, but we've got to do it. So I think that's going to be one of our big uh, challenges in the next several years. Uh, any other questions? Nobody mad about potholes or anything? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, thanks. thanks.